Good evening, everyone. All right, if you would take your copy of God's Word, turn with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, and I'm going to start reading at verse 35, uh, and then we will continue to work through what we, what we began last week. And this lesson here is a part two of the Lamb of God preached and pursued on purpose. The Lamb of God preached and pursued on purpose purpose. And subtitle is the question that I want to deal with tonight, and that is a critical question. What are you seeking? What are you seeking? And in verse 35, hear the word of the Lord. Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, What are you seeking? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where do you dwell? He said unto them, come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour. One of the two which heard John and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, the first find his own brother, Simon, and said unto him, we have found the Messiah, which being interpreted the Christ, and brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is by interpretation, a stone. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and find Philip and said unto him, follow me. And I'll stop right there. Really, we're just going to be dealing with verses 35 through 42. We'll pick up with verse 43 in the next few weeks. So we talked about point number one last week, where John is on day three. He's on day three of his... Um, witnessing and bearing record of Jesus Christ. And day one, he is being, uh, he, he is operating as an apologist. He is being apologetic. He is defending the truth. He is defending the truth concerning who he is not and concerning who Jesus is. Um, in day one, verses 19 through 28, that is where he says, I am not the Christ. I am not that prophet, I am not Elijah, but there's one that comes after me that is preferred before me, for indeed he was before me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. He humbles himself and he gives a testimony that glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ, preparing them to hear and see their Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah. Then the second day, the next day, in verse 29, it literally says, the next day John sees Jesus coming unto him and says, behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And finally, we're on day three, where he is declaring, where his disciples now are standing there with him, he's declaring, behold the Lamb of God. 
And it wasn't an option. It wasn't um, just an invitation to look, but it was a command. It was the command of faithful gospel proclamation, how he is declared. And he was pointing to a man, children, but he was saying, behold, the Lamb of God, which means that we're required to have spiritual minds to actually see beyond the man and see that this person is God's gift, is God's sacrifice for sinners. We talked about it in detail, and I don't want to go over it any much, uh, that much more today. We're called to see Jesus as God's chosen Messiah and his perfect mediator. But now what we're going to consider tonight is the call to follow the Savior by his grace. Um, this is how we are disciples. We're going to be talking at length about what it means to follow Jesus and what it means to be a disciple in relationship to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Um, something that we're all familiar with, something that most of us are today, but I think that it would do well for us to go a little bit deeper into it according to how John lays it out strategically here in John chapter 1. So subpoint A, disciples come, by, uh, come to Christ by faith through hearing instruction, through hearing instruction. So what does a disciple do? And it's very simple. A disciple follows the Lord Jesus Christ. A disciple follows. And remember what I said the word follow means. This word follow, oh, this doesn't work. The word follow literally means to walk the same road, to walk the same road, and it has to do with our union, it has to do with our union with Christ. They, they were literally walking on the same road as Christ. They, they heard John, and faith comes by what? hearing and hearing by the word of God, and they heard John, and they followed Christ, and they're walking on the same road as him, and they're walking following him. What they have in common is they're on the same road, and they're both, they're all walking in the same direction, but they're walking behind the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So, so what it means to follow him is to walk on the same road. That's the commonality that the disciple has, to walk together with Christ, that's communion. To walk in the same manner as Jesus, that's conformity. But behind him, and that's compliance and submission. Um, but behind him, that is compliance and submission. This is union with Christ. And this is how the life of Christ is expressed. Now, the question is, why do disciples of Christ follow him? Why do they follow him? And these questions are, I think, critical and, and, and simple, but critical to ask, because then the question would be for you and us, or for all of us, why do we follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Why? Why do we follow him? And, and pretty soon we're going, to be, we're going to be dealing with the question, what are we seeking? What is our motive? What is our motivation? What is our intent? What is the purpose? What are we trying to get out of following the Lord Jesus? Because it's very possible to be following him for the wrong reasons. And that, that, that'll, be, that'll be demonstrated in John's gospel and all over the scriptures when we deal with it. But why do they follow? Why do disciples of Christ follow him? It's very simple. They follow him because that is who they are. That is who they are. They are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when you take this word disciple, this word disciple, and this word disciple here is in our text. It's in verse uh, 35, where it references the two disciples of John who leave John and follow the Lord Jesus Christ upon him, declaring, behold, the Lamb of God. That word disciple um, is 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 the word in the I keep using this one is the word 
Mephetes. Mephetes. Now, what is this word right here, children? Math. This is where we get our word mathematics from, okay? This, this Greek term here. And when we talk about that word, it actually means that the, this, this Greek word means that a person has the mental, they have the mental effort needed to think through something properly. A disciple is a person that has the mental capacity to think through something. So, and this is a good example because John says, behold the Lamb of God. But he's pointing to a person that looks like and appears to be a man. But he's saying, behold the Lamb of God. Now they got to think through who this man really is. And once they arrive to the conclusion, this is who he is, guess what they end up doing? Following him. So what is a disciple when, with the capacity to think through something, to compute? A disciple is a learner. A disciple is a learner. A learner. A follower of Christ who learns the doctrines of Scripture in the lifestyle they are required in order to walk in the same manner as their master or their teacher or their lord right to walk to mimic and to and to imitate to take on the full identity of their teacher of their master as their own identity so their learners for the purpose of being conformed into the image and likeness of that master. They learn his mannerisms. They learn how he thinks, what he loves, what he hates. But, that, but, but if you're going to learn something about someone, doesn't it require for you to spend time with that person? Right. It requires you to spend time with that person. Not a little bit of time. Not on occasion. If that, if your identity is wrapped up in Christ, that means that you actually have to spend time with him for the purpose of learning of him so that you can walk like him, so that you can follow him, all right? This is a disciple, a learner, learner, a learner in the most classical sense, a learner. Now, what's important is what we talked about subpoint A. We talked about subpoint A last week. We, we talked about how the call is effectual. Again, subpoint A is disciples come to Christ by faith through hearing instruction. This is what they did. They heard John and they followed him. Well, the, this call that they heard is an effectual call from God through John to them by the Spirit of God, drawing them to the Lord Jesus Christ. First and foremost, drawing their attention to him and drawing them to come to him. This is something that is what we would call irresistible. This call is irresistible. This call is effectual. This call is an inner call. They heard the outer call, but they were moved inwardly to follow him. In John chapter 6, verse 44, you can go there. John 6, 44, this is what our Lord says. He says, no man can come to me except the Father which sent me, what? Draw him, and I will raise him up again at the last day. Verse 45, for it is written, they shall all be, what? Taught of God. Therefore, anyone that has heard and has learned of the Father comes to me. Did they, did they hear? Did you hear? Are you following him? Because you can't follow Christ without having heard his voice through the teaching of God's word first. It's effectual, right? It's also evangelical. It's inviting. And this is precisely what John's aim is. He is being evangelical in nature. In John 20, verse uh, 30 and 31, 
Many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the who? The Christ, the son of the living God. And by believing you will have life in his name. And that's that call. It definitely produces life eternal. This is what we talked about, John 17, 3. But I put an extra um, uh, bullet point in your outline, uh, number four, if you look at it. And this is, this is where we're going to press a little bit more deeper into uh, what it means to be a disciple that comes to Christ by faith through hearing instruction. All right. And, 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 and uh, bullet point number four, the call is to, and here's the first E, experiential. experiential it's the first one education experiential education endurance and emancipation which really is liberty. I just had to make that an E. <laughs> All right, e emancipation. Yeah, and I'm gonna I'm gonna demonstrate that. Turn to John chapter eight. John chapter eight. I wanna I wanna show you something in in three passages uh, that we're gonna work through, and we're gonna see this here. We're gonna see this here in John chapter eight. And, and, and what I love about uh, John, the apostle, who is the author of the Gospel of John, what I love about him is that he defines his terms. And he, pays close, he paid close attention to his master when he was here upon the earth. He gazed at him. He actually scrutinized him. He studied the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, a disciple is a learner. They study they handle, they, 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 they look upon, they're obsessed with their master. And he frequently defines his terms and he actually is recording here, the Lord defining what a disciple actually is. And here it is in verse 31 of John 8. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. So a disciple is one who continues walking by faith in the word of their Lord. That's what a disciple is. And here, here's the thing. Do, will you understand everything that the Lord says? Will you understand everything at first? Will you understand everything down here? Well, don't we look through a glass dimly in part? We don't see the whole thing. And why am I even talking like this? Because to continue in his word, to remain in his word, to abide in his word is to walk in the obedience of faith concerning his word, even if you don't understand it. Because what you do know is that though you don't understand what, why you have to actually obey his word, and you don't know what it means. And what you understand is that later on, you will know. You will come to know the truth. Here's what it says here in, in verse 31. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth. You shall experientially come into that knowledge of the truth by continuing in his word. That's the promise, right? Now, for a lot of people who claim to be Christians, when they hear this promise right here, it's not appealing to them. The question is, is it appealing to you? Is it appealing to you to come to a saving knowledge of the truth as a consequence of walking in obedience, the obedience of faith according to God's word? Is learning <laughs> the truth important to you? If it's not, then you won't continue in his word. 
And if you don't continue in his word, you're not his disciple. Right? So this, the, 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 the true disciple of Christ craves the promise of coming to a saving knowledge of, a, of his truth. It's this, this process of sanctification. That you're, you're, you're growing in grace and in the what? Knowledge of the Lord. You're, this is, they, they, they want to learn. They want to grow. Why do they want to learn? Why do they want to come to a knowledge of the truth? And we're talking about experiential education here. They're, they're, they're coming into this knowledge of the truth intimately for a specific goal, liberation. So the implication, therefore, is that a disciple understands that they are sinners. Let's be honest. We're sinners. Disciples of Christ are sinners, saved by grace, and they they're still have some bondages in their life. Now, if you're not able to admit that, then you're not a disciple. Because our Lord says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. This is future promises that our Lord is making to those who walk and continue in his word. If you think you're already free and you're already liberated and you don't need to be liberated for anything, there's no reason for you to continue in his word. There's no reason for you to crave the promise of coming to know the truth. And guess what? If you don't crave the truth, you know who you don't crave? You don't crave Jesus. Because Jesus is the way, the what? The truth and the life. No one comes into the Father but by him. Just because he saved you at Calvary's tree in his death and rose for your justification and is seated at the right hand of God, ever living to make intercession on your behalf and preparing a place for you, it doesn't mean that you're glorified yet. You're in process. This is what we call sanctification. True disciples of Christ crave the promise of coming to know the truth as learners True disciples of Christ confess their sins in relationship to the lamb. Again, again, they're following the lamb. We're still in John 1. We're fo they're following the lamb of God. They understand the concept of the lamb. The lamb is provided for sinners. Why would they follow the lamb if they were not sinners? Needing forgiveness, needing pardon, needing mercy needing to be liberated from the condemnation of God, needing to actually be reconciled to God. Why would they follow the lamb if they didn't need any of that? The true disciple counts on the Lord's promise of liberty. Now we know that, 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 that the Lord is the truth. He makes a promise. Now, if, if you're thinking in your mind and in your heart, what is this dude talking about, right? Well, in the word of God anticipates those kind of antagonistic thoughts. Look at verse 33. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou that you shall be made free? So there you go. They did not think that they were in bondage. They therefore were not craving him. They were not continuing in his word. They did not care for Christ. They did not actually want liberation because they were, in their minds, never in bondage to any man. And that shows you the, 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 the grave darkness that they were in because they were in bondage to the Roman Empire during that time. It didn't feel like they're in bondage because they had a little bit of liberty, but they stepped outside of the lines of that liberty. They will feel the wrath of the Roman Empire. They were under Medo-Persian bondage. They were under Babylonian and, and, and Egyptian. But you go all the way back through redemptive history, and what they just said actually defies the truth. They were not telling the truth. When, when, when a person says, I'm not in bondage, you're lying. 
I mean, the, the freest person in the world was the Lord Jesus Christ. And even he was bound for me. You better than Christ? Who willingly was bound for me? Behold the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God needs to be bound in order for me to be what? Free. Substitution. But here, if we continue reading, continue reading, in verse 34, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say unto you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And the slave abides not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. If the son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Well, the son just said, Jesus just admitted that the son is the truth that lets you free. And what he just admitted was that if you continue in his word, revelation that you get later on, as according to promise, is a, full, is a greater revelation of Christ that liberates you. So that you can walk in the liberty with which Christ has made you free. That's why Bible study and and, and, and churches who preach the gospel, they have it right. We're called to incessantly and continually set Christ before you because you still need to be liberated. And I love how our pastor put it. I think it was last Sunday, right? He says he's not going to stop until his people are liberated. Very profound. Very profound. But... Here, here's what we have. So when we, look at, uh, when we look at John 8, 31 through 36, what we're looking at is we are looking at um, the identification of a true disciple. So mark that, the identification of a true disciple. identification. It is defined in John 8, though, those who continue in my word, those who continue in my word, those who have a biblical worldview, those who continue in my word, those who love what I love and hate what I hate, those who seek to live the way that I live, those who love God's law, those who love God's word, and when we fail and we fall short, we admit it. We confess our sins, knowing that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The second thing that I want you to know, turn to John 13. John 13. John 13. I want you to see the imitation of a true disciple, all right? In, in, in John 13, remember our Lord, he gets a napkin and, or a, a towel and he wraps himself and he, he gets a, a, you know, a bowl of water and he begins to do what? Wash the disciples' feet, right? Um, and Peter was like, no, Lord, don't do it. And he says, if you don't let me do this, you have no part with me. He said, okay, Lord, well then wash my head too, my, my armpits and, and, and everything. Uh, you know, we, we, we do too much, don't we? Um, but our Lord says, nope, just your feet. And then what we have, if you look here in verse 12, so after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, do you know what I have done unto you? You call me master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. And then he goes on to say, if I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, 
you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. Now, what is the, what, what, what is the principle that Jesus is teaching his disciples? It's one word. Yeah, it de definitely service, but, but, but when you're serving someone, what is that act? Well, yeah, you're, you're, you're being humble when you're serving someone else, but it's an act of love, okay? It's an act of love. He's teaching them how to love one another. He's teaching them how to love one another. Yes, humility is there, service is there, but he's teaching them how to love, because it's by loving one another that you mark a disciple of Christ, okay? And it looks like them serving one another and them actually doing even the lowest job of washing the feet of those who enter in. We're willing to, we're willing to, and, and really we're, we're called to, to desire the lowest place to edify our own brothers and sisters. But he's teaching this principle of love. An example, this is an example of love. And he's calling them, uh, Pastor Jesse calls it a, a hoopadine, right? Where, 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 where you're, you're actually um, following behind the list. This is another example of following Jesus. You're following his example, right? You're following his example of love for one another because that's what a disciple does, follows the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And then he goes on. He says in verse 16, truly, truly, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. It is big, Brother Lex. It's big because it kind of explains why sometimes we're not happy. <laughs> we're frustrated because we're, you know, we're not getting our way. It's about us. We're not getting what we want, when we want, how we want, at the time that we want it. We're frustrated. We're not happy. Well, we're not actually operating as a disciple, serving one another, not making it about ourselves, loving one another, loving one another. When you don't have an expectation of anything for yourself, but you want to exalt your brother and sister, you can't get frustrated. <laughs> happy. Happy in Jesus. All right, the last thing that I want to show you, and then we'll move on. Turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. In Matthew chapter 11, this is where uh, you see the invitation to discipleship. So you have the identification of a true disciple, and then you have the invitation of a true disciple, now an invitation to discipleship. And this is in Matthew chapter 11, starting at verse uh, 27. All right, so verse 27, it says, uh, I'll just read it. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knows the Son but the Father. Neither know any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. So really, what Jesus is actually um, uh, at, uh, confessing is that he is sovereign, over who knows, who comes to know God the Father, who comes to know the one true God. He actually is the one that reveals him to whosoever he pleases, and he conceals him. Like some people know God and some people do not know God in a saving way. Is this true? This is just true. In fact, this is what Jesus does in a, a lot of people today, a lot of Christians today would actually hate this Jesus in verse 25. 
At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hid these things from the wise and the prudent and have revealed them unto babes. He's thanking God for hiding truth from the wise and the prudent and revealing them unto babes. People would get mad at that. A babe is, the analogy has to do with being, you know, those who are lowly, those who are helpless, those who are, those who are um, in humble circumstances, those who are poor, those who are utterly dependent versus the wise and prudent who are self-sufficient, who are prideful, who actually can do things on their own and don't need any help from anyone else because they got it. They know how to do everything and, and, and they, they can do it. And, and, and they won't ask for help, filled with pride. Those are the ones that God hides his truth from. And what, what does God need to do? If, if, say, say we're proud and, and, and we're, we're full of ourselves. What does God need to do in order, in order to reveal himself to us? He has to humble us. <laughs> because God resists the what? And he gives grace to the what? And this is what Jesus is thankful for. He's thankful that God has revealed this to babes. And that's what I meant by him also in the same manner, equal with the father, having sovereign authority to reveal his father to whosoever he wills. But really, I wanted to go to verse 27 or 28. Come unto me, all ye that, are, that, that, that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? All right, so no one that no one's going to come to Christ <laughs> unless they're actually looking for and need what? Rest. All right, so whatever it means, this this rest Christ provides. Verse 29. He says, "Take my yoke upon you and what? And learn of me." So this is a call to discipleship. This is called this is a call to you actually wearing the same yoke as him, like two oxen that are treading the corn together. You, it, it, you're being called into close proximity to the Lord Jesus Christ so that you can actually learn his ways. And you can become in step with him and collaborate with him and walk with him. This is, this is a call not only to discipleship, but it's a call to unity. It's a call to union with Christ. There's no rest outside of union with Christ. Take upon my yoke, take, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest unto your souls. Now, here's the thing. When you're not resting, you are worried, you are always working, you are always toiling, you might be anxious, you might be depressed, you might be angry, you're not settled. So we can deal with all the different emotional things that happen to us when we're not resting. The solution that Christ is giving is that you need to draw nearer to him. You need to draw nearer to him in prayer, in his word, in order to find rest. Why keep to yourself? Why go somewhere else when rest is only found in Christ? Well, I'm already as close to Christ as I'm going to be. Positionally, you are. Positionally, we are. But functionally, can't we go far away? Tell the truth. Can't we drift? Aren't we like sheep that have gone astray? Doesn't the good shepherd have to come and get us and bring us back, first of all, to our senses and then back to fellowship and then back to a walking with him in this, in this life, walking by faith? See, this is, this is important. This call is not just for those who are lost. This call is for those who are actually saved. Because sometimes we take the yoke off and go about it our own way. And then we lost. Then we realize we oxes and we can't find our way back. We're stubborn. <laughs> we won't go back. And then we're dumb like sheep. We can't find our way back. And we need someone to come get us. And that's that effectual call, the gospel, by which that happens. And then verse 
30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you feel like the yoke is too tight, it's not the Lord's yoke. All right? It's not the Lord's yoke. It's whatever expectation you're putting on yourself or others putting on you. It's rooted in error and not in truth. Okay? So this, this, this is important. This is important to assess. Now, let's, let, let's, let's, let's press into this. So we're, we're gonna, let's go back to our text because I just wanted to deal with that because we're dealing with what it means to come to Christ by faith um, according to his grace, how that is um, how a disciple operates. How that, that, that's what a disciple looks like. That's what a disciple is and that's what a disciple does. They come, they follow him. They're learners of him. And they identify with him. But I want to deal with subpoint B now. Subpoint B in your outline. Subpoint B, disciples commune with Christ for fellowship as their heart's intent. Now, why would I say that? Look here in verse uh, 37 in John 1. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following him. So you, 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 can, you can kind of sense what's going on here, the narrative. Say you're walking down the street. Don't you know when someone's following you? <laughs> now, what we do is we're like, oh, where's my pepper spray? Where's the, the quickest way to get out of this? You know, you start to kind of trip a little bit. Our Lord senses someone following him, and he said, he just turns around and looks at him and says, what do you want? Right? What are you looking for? What are you looking for? What are you seeking? Right? That's the kind of Savior we have. But I want you to see something very, very um, and this is the question that I ask, that, that's the subtitle of your outlet. What are you seeking? What are you seeking? So I want to deal with the question asked. He's asking, what are you seeking? What are you looking for? What is the purpose of your pursuit? Right? Um, and this is why I called the lesson, the Lamb of God preached and pursued on purpose. All right? On purpose. Um, now, there's a couple things I want to deal with this phrase. Just keep, keep in mind, what are you seeking? What are you seeking? First, I want you to note is that if you look at John's gospel, Jesus hasn't spoken until this very point in time here. These are the first words that John records our master say in his gospel. The very first words. They're very probing, very profound. They're very sobering and searching very searching. And not only this, but they're following him and he senses they're following him and he turns around and he speaks to them. Who spoke first? Them or the Lord? The Lord. The Lord. The Lord spoke to them first. And I'm so glad that he speaks to us first. <laughs> I'm so glad. Because had he not said anything, we would have just been following him. Like weirdos, just following him. <laughs> right? Just following him. Well, that's what sheep are, right? Right. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. And they what? They follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. So again, these analogies are seen throughout the gospel of John and we're dealing with this here. He speaks to them first, he engages in conversation and he engages the fellowshipping first. And this is just axiomatic. We don't come to God first, he comes to us. If he doesn't come to us, we won't go to him. In fact, they didn't even start following him until the word of God was preached first. We need God 
to first come to us. In fact, we love him because he what? First loved us. This is axiomatic. So what I want you to mark first as we're thinking about what are you seeking? What are you seeking? The first thing we should mark is that which is most important to the Lord. That which is most important to our Lord Jesus Christ, what he is concerned with. Right here, you get to see the heart of your Savior. Right here. Right here. You get to see the heart of the Master. Because what he's concerned with He's concerned with the matters of your heart. He's concerned with the matters of your heart. And I'm about to show this to you in a, in a moment. What are you seeking? He is so concerned. He is concerned with the heart's need and desire. What do you need? What is your desire? Now, Jesus is not being a genie. But he actually is asking them a question to cause them to assess why they are following him because he already knows. He already knows. He already sees their heart. In fact, you hear the colloquial saying, you wear your heart on your sleeve. He sees their heart. But he wants them to be aware of why they're doing what they're doing. Because tell the truth, don't we do some, don't we do things sometimes aimlessly? Let's just be honest. Aimlessly, like we don't have a rhyme or rhythm to why we do what we do. And then there's times when after we did it, we're like, man, why did I do that? <laughs> right? Why did I say that? And then you go, what is wrong with me? Right? Well, that's because we don't think about what we're doing and why we're actually doing it. We don't actually assess our hearts. And, 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 and the reason why it's, it's kind of hard to assess your heart is because you need help assessing your own heart. What Christ was doing is he was helping them see themselves. And we need Christ to actually engage us at the level of our heart so that we can actually assess ourselves. So here's, here's uh, what we need to see real quick. There's a total of four uh, parts to this question that exposes four components to the heart. Four components to the heart. It's amazing. And we want to actually take our time assessing this from the scriptures. So he recognizes that they're following him like they're following. They're, he recognizes the first thing that they're actually following him, that they're pursuing him. He recognizes that they're pursuing him, that they're moving, that they're acting, right? All right, so, so, so that, that actually has to do with the, the component of the heart that, 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 that is our volition. All right, our volition, our determination, the decisions, the, the decisions that we make. This is the act of the will. This is that component of the heart. He sees that they're pursuing him. It's evident, right? It's, he, he sees they're following him, and then he asks them a question, right? And the question implies they're following him. Right? Daniel 1 8 tells us this, and I'm going to read it to you because I'm, I'm going to go through a, a couple of passages. You can go there, but I'm going to read it to you and you can just validate if, if I'm telling the truth or not. 
In, in Daniel 1.8, it says, but Daniel purposed in his heart, he determined in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So you see the scriptures target something that Daniel did. He made a decision. He made a determination. And that determination came from his heart. He determined, he purposed in his heart not to eat of the king's meat, not to defile himself. So he sees Jesus in, in John 1, sees they're pursuing him, but also he recognizes that they're pursuing him for a reason, that there's a purpose to them. Because our hearts, and this has to do with our rational thoughts. This has to do with our intentions. This has to do with the, the, the reason. So the heart not only acts, in terms of making decisions and determination, but it thinks and it has intents, okay? That's another component of the heart. And so and if you read Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it says, God looked down and saw that um, the wickedness of man was great upon the earth and how every imagination of the thought and intent of the heart was only evil continually. So you see, even in the book of Genesis, what's opened up is the heart of all mankind in the day when God decided, when he was determined to destroy all flesh from off the face of the earth. The basis of his decision was the fact that the imagination of the thought and the intent of the heart was only evil in that continually. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? There's so many other passages that we can think about. So many other passages. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. But it, it, it says this, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of joint and marrow and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So our Lord is concerned with their action, which, proceed, which is proceeding from their heart. He's concerned with their thoughts. He's concerned with their intents. He is concerned with those things. The third component has to do with our deepest passions. He knows that this purpose that they have is rooted in their deepest passion and desires of the heart that they are desiring to fulfill, that they're desiring to fulfill. He understands that there's a purpose for them following him. They're going to answer that. But there's a goal, too, and that's where the passions are fulfilled. We talk, we're, this, this right here has to do with desire, desire. And I'm just going to read one verse in Psalm 37, verse 4. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Now, the fourth component. And I want you to get this here. The fourth component was alarming to me. It was alarming to me because I didn't realize this. This is important. So you, you have... Your volition, where you make decisions, where you, 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 you know, this is the act of the will. That's the one component. Then you have thoughts and intents, and then you have desires. The fourth component of the heart is that the heart actually, like when you combine all those together, the heart is actually saying something. The heart is speaking. I'm not talking about the scripture that says, out of the abundance of the heart does the mouth speak. I'm saying that the heart actually speaks where there's no words that are heard. That the, the heart actually has a mind and a mouth, metaphorically speaking. And God hears the heart. He doesn't just see it. He hears the heart. A couple of verses for you. A couple of verses for you. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 24. I want you to see this. Genesis 24. In Genesis 24, and again, as we're thinking about um, 
as we're thinking about our Lord asking them a question, it is rooted in what he already knows and what he has already heard from their heart. The heart is actually speaking. And I want you to see this very carefully. Uh, so Abraham sent his servant to go find his son, a bride. And his servant is praying in grave detail. Now, I want you to see this. He, uh, he starts, uh, I don't even know where he starts at, but he, here, here he says, um, uh, let's, let's just start right here in verse 40. And he said unto me, the Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with you and prosper your way. Um, this is Abraham speaking. And you shall uh, take a wife for my son and of my kindred and of my father's house. Um, you, then shall you be clear from my oath when you come uh, to my kindred and if they give not you one you shall be clear from my oath and I came this day unto the well and said O Lord so he's speaking right now he says O Lord my God O Lord God of my master Abraham if you if now you do prosper my way which I go, behold, I stand by the well of the water and it shall come to pass that when the virgin comes forth to draw water and I say to her, give me, I pray, a little water of your pitcher uh, to drink. And she say to me, both drink you and I will um, also draw for your camel. Let the same be the woman whom the Lord have appointed out for my master's son. You see that? So he's praying. Look at verse 45. And before I had done speaking, where? <laughs> he was speaking in his heart. And before he was done, the Lord answered his prayer. Amen? But also, I want you to see one more passage, and then we'll continue to move forward. What time is it? Let's see here. What time we got? Okay. All right. So 10 more minutes. All right. So uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. Um, and this is another person. This is another person praying. Hannah is praying. Hannah is praying. She wants a child. She wants a child. And I'm pretty sure some of you are already aware of this, uh, this uh, passage. She was praying to the Lord for a child. But I want you to fast forward to verse uh, 12. Verse, uh -huh, First Samuel chapter 1, chapter 1. Did I, did I say the chapter? I'm sorry. Um, chapter 1, verse 13, verse 12. Look at verse 12. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Okay, so he marked her mouth. This is the high priest. He marked her mouth. Verse, verse 13. Now Hannah, she spake where? Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunken. Was he wrong? He was wrong. Judge, don't judge according to appearance, right? We have to delay judgment. Where, where, where was she praying from? Her heart. Tell the truth. Some, somebody might ask you a, a brutally honest question. And what you say in your heart is not necessarily what you say with your mouth, trust me. <laughs> Sometimes, right? In your heart, you say something a lot more honest than what comes out of your mouth. Either that's discretion or that's hypocrisy. I don't know whichever one that is. But the point is, those four components, he is actually engaging 
He is engaging at the level of the heart when he says, what are you seeking? He's saying, what are you thinking? What are, what are you determined to do? What have you determined to do? What are your desires? What are you saying by following me? He's engaging the heart. He's engaging the heart. And now we can apply the verse, out of the abundance of the heart does the mouth what? Speak. He is calling them to speak what's on their heart. What are you seeking? A question of the heart's desire, passion, intent, goal, and aim for following Jesus. The question is, are you seeking to get something out of Jesus or from Jesus? Are you seeking Jesus? Do you just want something from him? Like, is he just a means to your end? Or is he your end? Are you seeking to gratify the flesh? Are you seeking soul salvation and Christ's exaltation? This is a question of why do I go to church? Why do I read my Bible? Why do I pray? What do my praise, prayers consist of? <laughs> right? This is a cause for self-examination, right? This is a searching question. And I didn't want to just go over that question because it's the first thing he says in John's gospel. I even had to assess myself and say, you know what? At the end of the day, like, what, what, what am I really seeking? Why, why am I a Christian? Why do I believe? Right? Why, why, why do I go to church every Sunday? Why do we do Bible study? Critical questions. Why do I say no to sin? Why do I repent when I sin? Why? Right. Now we're, 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 we're under the scrutiny of God's word assessing our hearts and helping us assess our hearts. Are we, what, 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 to what end are we following the lamb? Now, this is important. This is, this is important because what our Lord does, and I, I guess we're going to have to end right here. We're going to have to end right here. We're going to have to end in an in a excursion of scripture um, of demonstrating how this is a, a subject that is constantly dealt with in John's gospel. Now, if, if John is being evangelical, in his presentation of his account and his testimony of Jesus, wouldn't it make sense for the concern to be at the depths of your soul? And the, the, the promises and, 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 and that, that which is taught and declared are appealing to the needs, the deepest needs of our hearts, the deepest needs of our soul. Jesus talks about this frequently, and he, he says it. I mean, just think about it. When he's talking to the woman at the well, he's talking to the woman at the well, and he says to her in verse 13, because she was, he, he engaged, he started talking to her first again. He says, whosoever drinks this of this water shall thirst again, shall thirst again. But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said unto, unto him, sir, give me this water, right? So, but he does this again. He does this again in John 6. In John 6, 
he's engaging with um, disciples, uh, with those who are saying that they are disciples. And Jesus calls it out. And, and, and you, you know, you would want the Lord to help you be honest in this life before you stand before him on the last day, right? You would want the Lord to help you be honest while you're living today, as opposed to you finding out on the last day when you stand before him that you were following him for the wrong reasons and he cast you in the lake of fire. Here's what the Lord says in verse 26 of John 6. He says, truly, truly, I say unto you, you seek me. So he acknowledges the fact that they're seeking him. Just like he's asking his disciples, what are you seeking? You're seeking me. Not because you saw the miracle, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath the Father, have God the Father sealed. So the meat that is imperishable, he's really talking about himself. He's not talking about something other than himself. When he says, I'll give it to you, he's talking about giving us himself. Do you want Christ? Now here, if you fast forward all the way down to verse 30. They said, therefore, unto him, what sign showest thou then that we may see and believe you? And what work do you do? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, and as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, truly, truly, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. Verse 34, you, you, you hear what they're about to say? Then they said unto him, Lord, evermore, give us this bread. Isn't he, a, he's being evangelical. He's being, he's being intentional. He's being cunning. He's letting them know this, he's, he, he's, 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 he's being appealing. We want this bread. But they really don't want this bread. Because when he says, all right, you want this bread? I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Verse 36, but as you have seen me, verse 36, but I said unto you that you also have seen me and believe not. And not only this, but at the end of this, because this is the height of his popularity with the most disciples who are following him. After he gets done talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, most of his disciples walk away. And this is where we end right here. And we're going to pick back up where we left off in two weeks. And we have at the end... Uh, Look at uh, verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So many of his, it says disciples, those who are supposed to be learners, those are, are the ones that are supposed to follow Jesus. Those are the ones who are supposed to find their identity in him. They're supposed to receive him and believe him and continue with him. They stop following him. They leave him. Now, how many people have left the church? How many people have left the church? How many people have left Christ? This is what we call apostasy. People are acting like they're following him genuinely, but they're genuinely wrong and they're following him for the wrong reasons. And when they realize, I'm not gonna get that satisfied in Christ, 
he's not going to provide that for me. There's no use anymore following him. When he, be, when he offends me, and this, is, this is the biggest thing in the church too. When you get offended, do you just stop going to church because you're offended? Do you stop attending because you're offended? Think about it. Have you ever been offended in the church? And you thought you were right all to find out that you were wrong and that that was God speaking? Right. People don't like being offended. And they think the kind of Jesus that we serve does not offend us. Like he's just <laughs> nice all the time. Like we don't get toe up or anything. We don't get chastened. Like, you know, those whom the Lord love, he what? Like the Lord don't chasten us. Like there's not going to be an offense that happens. This pie in the sky Christianity. What, how, how does Pastor Jesse call it? He calls it, uh, huh? Well, how does, what does Pastor Jesse call it? A romantic faith? A romantic faith? They walk away from him because they're offended. And they don't understand him. Now, a disciple that doesn't understand, what are they, what are they supposed to do? Ask questions. So this helps you deal with you getting rubbed the wrong way and being offended. You might not understand correctly. So what do we need to do? We need to ask questions for clarification. Right? We need to ask, Lord, I don't understand this. Help me. But they just walk away. They isolate themselves. They depart from the Lord Jesus Christ. They reject him. And then it says this. Jesus asked his disciples, Jesus said unto the twelve, will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. What was he after? Eternal life. And where is eternal life? In Christ. That's why he said, where shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Verse 70, Jesus answered them, have not I chosen you 12? And one of you is a devil. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him being one of the 12. And betrayal only comes as a consequence of, you know what? He's not what I thought he was. And I'm not getting from him what I want to get from him. So I'm just going to sell him out. Because what I really want is money. You can't serve both God and mammon. You just can't. You're going to love one and you're going to hate the other. And that's what happened with Judas Iscariot. So that, that there, um, that concludes our lesson for this evening. Um, we're going to pray and, and, and ask the Lord blessing on, on our um, fellowship. And if there's any questions, please ask them. Those who have to leave, you're free to go. But let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for uh, your word and the truth as it is in Christ. We thank you for, um, for helping us to stop and ponder uh, the question that our master asked the two and that we're considering as well, what are we seeking from the Lord? What are we seeking in our following the Lord? And, and Lord, that is something that um, we need to consider. We're so thankful that um, the Lord uh, confronts us with that question because we can't just follow him for any old reason. But Lord, we pray that you would help us to follow him for the right reasons and reveal what that actually is. We know that um, he has the words of eternal life, that he is the Christ, that he is the son of God, that he is the lamb of God. He is our mercy seat. He is our righteousness. He is our identity. He is our Lord and our master and our God. He is our big brother. He is, the, he is our 
our everything. And without him, we are absolutely nothing and we can't do anything, Lord. And we, we, we thank you so much. Help us to spend more time with the Lord. Help us to um, really um, dwell with him because the disciples asked, where do you live? We, we, help us to live with Christ and be satisfied just being with him and studying him and observing him so that we can be like him. Um, Lord, we thank you for this time and your spirit among us and um, probing our hearts. Um, forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, you know, apply the blood of the lamb to our conscience um, and, and help us to honor you more. Um, we, we, we ask that you give us safe traveling mercies uh, from this place, but never from your presence to our homes. Give us sweet rest and, and sleep tonight, a strengthening rest and sleep. And if it be your will, wake us up to do your will, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so next week,